If you've got your copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn to Romans chapter 12. If you've been with us at all this summer, the last six weeks at least, you may have already turned there because that's where we have been and we will continue to be for a few more weeks yet to come this week and a couple more to go. Romans chapter 12 has been our text, the one chapter throughout these entire six weeks and it will be further. Romans chapter 12, the title of the sermon series, A Profile of Christian Service. A Profile of Christian Service. In preparation for today's message, I don't know how many of you have words that you might use and only as you're using them or after you're using them wondering, did I use them correctly? (laughs) If you're talkative like I am, that's a pretty common concern that you have used the word incorrectly. And one example that came up in the study in preparation for today's message was the difference between sympathy and empathy. Do you feel like you have a good handle on that? The difference between sympathy and empathy. As I was thinking towards it, I was concerned. I always am concerned with words like that, two words that are similar but they really are distinct, and have I gotten them correct in my usage in the past? So I looked it up to make sure I was using it correctly. Many of you probably already knew this, so humor my ignorance, right? But as you might have expected, as many of you know, and I guess in some ways I knew this but wanted to confirm it, that sympathy is the idea of showing sorrow and pity but doing so, remaining on the outer rim of the distress of the person that you're interacting with. Kind of remaining on the outside. Maybe as genuine as you can muster it, but that is what sympathy is. Remaining somewhat detached from the distress of the person that you are ministering to, the friend or family member, whatever it might be, and whatever their distress might be, you are sympathetic. You are trying to just simply show an appropriate level of sorrow and pity for them. Empathy, if maybe you were to think of them as being similar, it might be viewed in better respect as degrees, right, of something very similar. It's still a sorrow or a pity or a compassion, but it is that, especially with the sense of you Stepping into the experience more so to really try and embrace exactly what that person is going through. The best way that we see this lived out is in the idea of counsel or therapy or even human psychology. I ended up reading a couple of articles to try and gain the distinction between sympathy and empathy, and I found a couple of human psychology articles to read. And they made this distinction. And in fact, the writers of some of these articles, I think psychologists themselves, the writers of some of these tried to make that distinction and talk about the good and the, and the bad of each. Primarily the, the difficulty of showing sympathy and not making the other person feel like an object of pity and really moving more as a counselor towards empathy but still having to remain somewhat of an objective observer. Empathy allows you to see it and allows you to experience it, but as a, as a therapist, in their case, as a therapist, the idea of it is that I still have to remain objective because I want to help this person see clearly. Those are the differences between sympathy and empathy. I thought much of it as I was wrestling with it in this particular passage today. As we have done it each week, I invite you to stand with me in honor of God's Word. I'm going to read all of chapter 12 of Romans from the New American Standard Bible. I'll read all of the verses, 1 to 21, and then we'll focus in on a few. Chapter 12, verse 1, the New American Standard Version. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. 
For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all members do not have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith, if service, in his serving, or he who teaches, in his teaching, or he who exhorts, in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, He who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. May God add his blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. You may be seated. The title of the sermon series is a profile of Christian service, all coming from Romans chapter 12. Today's message is the power of love. This may be one of the most enjoyable messages that I could give, that the Word of God gives us, because it talks about love. Now, if you were with us last week, you know that love was actually introduced last week. In verses 9 to 13, we looked at the 12 characteristics of sincere love. And when we interact with one another, these 12 characteristics should be on display. They should be on display, and in so doing, protect ourselves from hypocritical love. Two-faced, wearing a mask. No, rather openness and honesty, genuineness and sincerity. So love was actually introduced last week, and the title that I gave last week's message was Purifying Sincere Love. Today's is The Power of Love. You see, love began in verse 9, but it really carries through the remainder of the chapter. It doesn't stop at verse 13 where we stopped a week ago. It continues on, and the subject of love is an umbrella over really all that remains of chapter 12, of Romans chapter 12. And today, we are going to look at the three verses, verses 14, 15, and 16. And the, the, the sermon title is The Power of Love. Purity of love, we looked at a week ago. Today, the power of love. Verse 14 says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. The first thing that I want us to see in this, and it comes directly out of verse 14, is sincere love does the impossible. Sincere love does the impossible. You see, we are unable, and I use the example of empathy and sympathy and the distinguishing characteristics, but I shared with you that I I learned of it, at least in its classical definition, in each word's classical definition, in the context of human psychology. And I'm not here to berate human psychology or anything like that, but what we need to understand is that love cannot be exhibited apart from the person of Jesus Christ, not 
sincerely, not genuinely. It cannot be it cannot be exhibited. It cannot be carried through to the fullest extent by any way possible apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. We talked about it a week ago. We said, Pastor Mike even referred to it just a moment ago, that God defines love. He is its definition. God is love. The Apostle John says, that is, that is his heart coming through and interacting with humanity is love. And apart from him, thereby meaning maybe human psychology, empathy or sympathy or any kind of compassion cannot fully enter in until the Spirit of God brings life to it and reveals the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and God's love for us. Can any of us ever show empathy, sympathy, compassion? It is not possible apart from him. But sincere love does the impossible. Look at what he says in verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. This word bless here is not talking about just a platitude or a bumper sticker kind of bless. A word that I might say to you in passing. That is not the bless that is being described here. Paul is borrowing from an Old Testament concept much more so than he would in a philosophical way of bless. He is drawing from the bowels, the idea of blessing, of feeling deep within us compassion, feeling deep within us prayer for even those who would persecute us. And not to curse, which would be our human nature, but to bless. You see, sincere love does the impossible. Human nature cannot do, verse 14. It can't. There is nothing about our human nature that moves us in the direction to show blessing in the midst of persecution. Nothing within us. It is counter to our human nature. Only the love of God working through us can do the impossible to, in fact, bless one who would persecute you. I, I can, can sit there and, and, and struggle with this all day long in hopes that I could accomplish this within myself, and I realize it is impossible. It is impossible, but sincere love can do this. So what is it? How do you put those things together? The great lady saint by the name of Corey Ten Boom experienced horrors that none of us probably would ever know for ourselves. Horrors in her life and to those that she loved so much. Corey Ten Boom and her sister Betsy and their father, they experienced persecution that we could not even imagine. All for the sake of Christ, they did this. In her book, Hiding Place, Corey Ten Boom recounts the story of her life in a concentration camp because of her efforts to help Jewish people escape the Holocaust. And she describes this. What's funny about, we have this strong memory of Corey Ten Boom, and rightly so. But what she would say if she were here today is that it was not her, but rather her sister, Betsy, who was her inspiration. Because Betsy, her older sister, seemed to put on Christ more than Corey ever could imagine doing in the midst of persecution. And there are many stories in that book, Hiding Place, where Betsy is leading Corey into Christ-like love for the most horrific circumstances that they would ever face. Corey has this statement very briefly out of this book that I want to share with you, Hiding Place. She says this, When he, speaking of God in our lives, when he tells us to love our enemies, he gives, along with the command, the love itself. Isn't that marvelous? 
that God calls us to love even our enemies, even those who would persecute us, but he doesn't command us to do that and leave us on our own as though a spinning top that has been set in motion. No, he knows we cannot do this. He says, Gordon, I want you to love through persecution. And here's some interesting news. You can't and so I will through you. Not only does he give the command to love, but he gives the love itself. He gives the love itself so that I can truly bless those who would persecute me. And I love this, another quote I share with you. The founder and first president of Dallas Seminary, the the privilege that I had of attending this school, I never knew him. He was dead before I ever attended. But the founding president of Dallas Seminary, Lewis Sperry Chafer. In his book, He That Is Spiritual, I was sharing with Beverly this weekend as I was studying through this book, I had to read this book in school. (laughs) The founding president, you're probably going to read his books, right? I had to read this book, and I found it to be utterly unmoving to me. And I say that with great sadness, when I had to read it. That's probably the case, isn't it? When you have to read, that's the outcome. As I was leafing through it this week, reading this great book, He That Is Spiritual, I was overwhelmed by it. I'm so thankful for his witness, Dr. Chafer. And he said this in this book, He That Is Spiritual, about the subject of love. Love is not the working of the human affection. It is rather the direct manifestation of the love of God passing through the heart of the believer out from the indwelling spirit. I want you to hear this phrase, this sentence. It could not be humanly produced or even successfully initiated, and it of necessity goes out to the objects of divine affection and grace rather than the objects of human desire. I know that's kind of old language a little bit. Let me try and help contextualize this. I love this phrase, this idea that it is not that it goes out to the objects of my desire. The love of God does not go to who I desire it. It goes to who He desires it. It is His determination. It goes out to the objects of His divine affection and grace. I love that because what it tells me is that when I am, if, if I am experiencing some level of persecution, the bless that He calls me to do, bless and not curse, What he is calling me to do is he's saying, Gordon, I want them to see my love. I want them to see my affection. And I want you to be the instrument that shows them. Divine love poured out on who he desires, not who I desire. If I desired, it would be my wife. It would be my children. It would be many of you. And that's a good thing, but that's human initiated. The heart of the gospel, the heart of the scripture is that God said, I love those who do not love me. I am going to pour out my affection on them, Romans 5, 8. While we were yet sinners, enemies of God, Christ died for us. It's his determination on who the object of love is played out. His decision, not mine. And so that's why he can say, Paul, by way of the Holy Spirit, can say, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. In that same book, Hiding Place, Corey Ten Boom tells the story of watching the guards beat to death a mentally handicapped person. Called them feeble was the term that they used. And Corey and Betsy witnessed the most awful brutality. And Betsy said to her sister, Corey, someday, Corey, we are going to show them that love is more powerful than hate. And we're going to build a house someday, Corey, where that will be our message and we will invite them in. And Corey said this, I thought she was talking about the feeble ones. And she learned later, She meant the guards. She meant the guards. 
we are going to invite them into this home someday. I have this vision of this beautiful house where love overwhelms hate. And we will invite them. Who will we invite, Betsy? We will invite these heinous acts, these people. What does it sound like? What did, what did Jesus say? His nails were driven into his hands and his feet, and he was hung on a cross. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. What kind of love does that? Could you ever generate that love? Corey is honest, at least in her book. I can't. I can't generate that kind of love for that kind of brutality and hate and evil. And God says, my love overwhelms that. Sincere love does something else. It displays the heart of God. This is something that we talked about last week. It displays the heart of God. Love is His heart. It's what pushed Him to us. It's what caused Him to look at the life of His own Son and be willing to give it up for us. Love is the heart of God. I've shared this on many occasions in the past and it just cannot be said enough. We look at the the Bible in two testaments, the old and the new. And the old is the God of wrath and the new is the God of grace. That is untrue. God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Do we see a wrath-filled God in the Old Testament? Of course we did. We saw Him in the New Testament too. Where? At the cross. The wrath of God poured out on His own Son. But we think of the Old Testament as the, as the testament of wrath. And some of our maybe unbelieving friends might, might see some distinction, they think, between the two examples of this God. Maybe it's just two different gods. But I've shared this many times before. How does, Jesus, excuse me, how does God most clearly define Himself even in the Old Testament? The most common self-description given, repeated numerous times in the Old Testament, is this. The example I give you is Exodus 34, verse 6, but I could give you many. He says this, Then the Lord passed by in front of him, speaking of Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. That's how God revealed Himself in the Old Testament. And we come to John chapter 1, and Jesus' revelation is one of, He was the epitome of, what? Grace and truth. His character was consistent. God the Father, God the Son, and now God the Holy Spirit living His life through us. Living His empowerment for us. This is how we this is the heart of God. In verse 15 it says rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. I know that many of you, I even had a friend recently tell me, she said, I know that we're going to be looking at 14 and 15. I know that's what comes up in Romans. Gordon, I can't do 14. I was like, "Yes. You can't do 14." But But with all due respect to her, she says, I think I can do 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Mourn, some of your Bibles say. Mourn with those who mourn. You know, if we're really honest, we can't do that either. We can't do that either. Rejoice with those who rejoice. I've been in rejoicing, joyful situations. I've been in those. And I can go for a long way rejoicing, but what happens when you go a little too long? What if my brother and sister rejoices a little too much? What do I start doing? I start withholding my rejoicing. Because, hey, wait a minute. Your rejoicing overshadows mine. You have something to rejoice about. Maybe I don't see what I have to rejoice about anymore. And then even into mourning, Can I really mourn? Can I really enter in? Can my human empathy, 
Can it really step into this situation that is so needed in this moment? Can I really accomplish it? I've shared before this family that lost their daughter at eight years of age. We did our very best to mourn with them, to comprehend what must have been going on. I have a daughter. I did then. I still do today. Every day I go home to my daughter. I was with them as far as I could go. But I knew I would go home to my daughter and I would squeeze her and I would hold her. And I would find great relief in that. The love of God poured out through His Son is the only way that we can ever understand brokenness. For God took the brokenness of humanity on the cross. He placed it on His Son. He said, I'm going to take your sin and I'm going to put it on my Son. And I'm going to take my Son's righteousness and I'm going to give it to you. That's rejoicing and that's mourning. To an extent that only by the Spirit of God would we ever understand, comprehend, or carry out. Do you know that Jesus did both? He rejoiced with those who rejoiced. The very first miracle that Jesus conducted was at a wedding. Much to his chagrin that his mother kind of pushed on him, right? Hey, whatever he says, do, just do it. And she walks out. Jesus was at a wedding celebrating with his disciples and with the family. He was celebrating, he was rejoicing with those who rejoice. And at the greatest miracle outside of his own personal resurrection with his friend having died three, four days sooner, what did Jesus do? John eleven thirty five, 35, the shortest verse in the Bible, memorize it today. Jesus wept. He wept. Whenever I do funerals, and I have the privilege in the moment of sadness, of mourning, to do a funeral, I love reading John 11. Because for whatever reason Jesus wept, and there are different reasons why people would say that he wept. Well, because they didn't understand who he was, or they, what, whatever, it was his friend. Whatever it was, this we know. Jesus wept. He was brokenhearted. Jesus knows how to mourn, and Jesus knows how to rejoice. And only by us living his life, by the power of the Spirit, His love, not mine, His love, can we truly rejoice and or mourn in the right time and in the right way. The last thing is this. Sincere love sees others first. Verse 16, be of the same mind toward one another. That actually could be better translated. View each other equally. Look at each other the same. And he goes on to say, Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. He returns back to a, 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 something that he had said earlier in the chapter, right? In verse 3. Have sober judgment about yourself. See yourself clearly. See your lowliness complete, clearly. Why associate with the lowly? Because you are among them. Let's all just accept our deficiency. We're in the same place. We're sitting in a boat and we're looking next to each other and we're waving at each other in the same boat. We are all equally deficient until the love of God comes in and powers His way through us. Why on earth am I making claims for my own reputation, for my own love for my own accomplishment. The song that the worship team led us in, I will boast. What will I boast in? What am I to boast in? In Christ alone. His love. His righteousness. And not my own. This sounds very similar to, a, to another, maybe more famous verse, if, if there could be that. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. This great statement of the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. But before it leads into that, His own statement of humility. 
Paul says this, Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. There is only one way you can do that, and that is living out the sincere love of Christ. You cannot. You cannot put anyone above you, not even the most deeply loved one that you have. You cannot apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. When it comes to my marriage, I'm to, I'm to care for my wife as my own body. Why is that? Because I won't <laughs> do that. Why is it such a command? Why would Paul have to say that to me? Because I won't, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. To treat her as more important than myself. To treat any of you as more important than me. To defer always to you. I cannot do that, but sincere love has that power. It is power. Love is not, we got the, why is this message so meaningful to me? Love is not a rinky-dink emotion. Love is the power of God moving in the heart of a believer or of believers. It's why those 12 characteristics that we looked at up above, the ethical, the ways that we treat one another, that is describing kind of a healthy expression of love. It is the purity of it. It is the, it is the Ill- illustration of love. And this is where its power comes in, that you can bless those who persecute you, that you can mourn without end where that is required. And that you can have a right estimation of yourself and consider others more important than you are. That only comes from the love, from the power of the love of God lived out through the believer. Remember, it is his, like Dr. Chafer said in that quote, it is his decision who it is that receives his love and grace. It was for you, it was his decision. Why is it not still his decision? It is, isn't it? It's still his decision. And he has said, Gordon, you're going to have the great privilege of being the witness of my power. The power of my love lived out. You have the privilege. It's going to happen. It's going to shake the foundation. Do you want to be a part of it? In just a few minutes, we're going to take communion together. What on earth? (laughs) could we do that speaks? Jesus lived out these three verses. (laughs) He lived them out. He blessed those who persecuted Him. He blessed and did not curse. Oh my goodness, if anybody could have cursed, it would have been Jesus. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. What does 17 say? For he did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He had every reason, every legitimacy to judge and to convict. And there will come a day when he judges the world. But we live in a a season right now of where God says, Gordon, it's my love right now. It will always be my love, but it's expressed this way now. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Jesus knows how to rejoice, I'm telling you. And he knows how to mourn. Why 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 are we asked of this? Three reasons. The world needs to see this extravagant love. The world needs to see this extravagant love. Nobody loves. On the, on the cover of Time magazine, it was around 1984 when Pope John Paul II, which I don't know his heart, he conducted himself like a believer. I don't know that for sure, but I remember the cover of Time magazine when he went to forgive the man who had attempted to murder him. And the world, the point that I am sharing with you is the world could not understand it. They put him on the cover. What is this forgiveness? 
The world needs to see this extravagant love. The second is they need to see the character of Jesus that is rooted in it. And thirdly, it keeps you from seeing yourself as able to do it. Why would he ask you to bless those who persecute you? Does he want you to just take it and take it and take it and take it? No. He wants you to know it's only by me that you can do this. It's a gift to him. Lord, if you can bless those who persecute you, you're living my perfect and powerful love. The only thing that we can do is wake up every morning. What is the action step that I want you to leave with today? Tomorrow when you wake up, fall on your knees and say, God, I want your love to burst through me. It's kind of like a glove, right? If I had a glove, which I don't, I wish I did at this moment right now. If I had a glove and I set it right here on the table, do everything we could to get that glove to pick up this bottle of water. Everything we could. Come on, baby. Come on. Come on. The only thing that's going to pick up, that that, the only way that glove is ever going to pick up that bottle of water is when the hand goes in it. All those fingers and that palm, they get inside that glove and they start working. We are the glove. The Holy Spirit is the hand. And he says, I will do this for you. I will make this. Just like, just like it was said, Corey Ten Boom. When he commands us to love, he does something very gracious. He gives us the love to do it. Matt, if you would begin to make your way up, allow me to close in prayer and we will move to communion. Father God, we thank you that we are overwhelmed by the power of your love. We were overwhelmed by it, Lord. May we be the glove in which the Spirit of God, our hand, the hand in the glove, reaches out and touches the lives of those who need to see this extravagance. They need to see it. They need to see one who can bless and not curse in the midst of persecution, who can rejoice to the fullness of rejoicing and mourn to the fullness of mourning and can look at another more important than ourselves. That is not human love. That is divine love poured out on who you desire. And you give me a chance to just be the glove on your hand. Lord, as we take communion, would you remind us through the the sacrifice of your son himself of the truth of this love. In Jesus' name, amen.